Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. This is a very, very important presentation because unless we increase our numbers, the religious will continue to dominate society. And in this country and all over the world, they will continue to roll back our liberties by still commandeering much of the world's legal systems. And so the increase in the number of non-believers in our society is crucial, absolutely crucial, to the progress of secular humanism and even to the progress of the modern secular society. And we couldn't have a better representative of the facts and figures and statistics of this rise, which hopefully will be a tremendous growth. Our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Phil Zuckerman, got his BA in sociology, cum laude, from University of Oregon, got his MA from the same university, and also his PhD. He is a professor of sociology and the founding chair of the country's first secular studies program at Pitzer College in the Claremont, uh, California, which is... Now, he's author of several books, which include Being Secular, What We Know About the Non-Religious, Faith No More, Why People Reject Religion, Society Without God, and then coming out later this year, The Secular Life. So let's please welcome our guest speaker today, Dr. Phil Zucker. Thanks, nice turnout. Thank you for that introduction. Good to see everybody on this. I, I scored a goal this morning at soccer, so I'm feeling particularly good today. I just had, and it wasn't like an easy one. There was actually a defender. I got past him, so I'm like the worst one out there. But Unfortunately, it's a pickup game, so it was early on, so like half the guys didn't witness it, So, but what can you do? They all came later. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking about, well, I, I have given this talk once before recently in San Diego, so I don't want to tell the same story if you've all heard it before. So how many of you heard my visit to Oban story? Visit to Oban. Yes, it's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> Great news. Okay, ready. Uh, I'll start with that then. Thank you. That's good. Um, back in the, uh, God, sometime in the 90s, I was, uh, I was uh, younger and... Uh, this was before I had kids, before I was married, and I was backpacking through Europe and with a friend, and, uh, and I had met a guy named Nigel at a wedding two years before in Portland, Oregon, and we had had a nice time, and he said, if you're ever in Scotland, look me up, and this was before, I think it was before, well, certainly before Facebook. I don't know. I, wasn't, I don't think I was emailing at this point. Maybe. I can't remember. But I kept his, his info. And me and my friend, we met in London. We went to Wales. And then I said, you know, I got this. I called this guy Nigel. He answered the phone. I said, Nigel, it's Phil Zucker. Remember we met at that wedding in Portland? He's like, oh, Phil. Yeah. And it was summertime. I said, well, we're, me and my, I'm with the buddy. We're backpacking. He's like, yeah, come on, come on. So I said, well, we're, we're, I'm on vacation as well. We're on break. So me and my mates, we're backpacking as well. We're camping up in the hills of Scotland. Why don't you come and meet us there, and that'll be all great. And I said, oh, sounds fun. But um, So he said, well, we're going to be in Oban. So just meet us in Oban, you know. And, okay, so Oban's a small town in Scotland. I think they, it's famous for whiskey, I think they make, or something, scotch, something like that. I'm not sure the difference. Sorry. It's a Jewish trait. But, um, but um, so uh, anyway, we got up there. We ended up, me and my friend decided to opt out of the camping. Rain was in the forecast, so we stayed in a bed and breakfast. But we got to Oban, beautiful little town. Um, and I said, said, we're here. And he goes, oh, great, great. He goes, all right, we're all going to be out. We're going to go out tonight. We're going to party. I said, great. And he said, meet me. Meet at the church, you know, the center of town. You know, be there around 7. I said, okay. Okay, the church. So he said, yeah, he can't miss it. Just the main church set downtown, down, town square will be there. I said, okay. So I started to figure out why would we meet at a church for a night of drinking? 
And I thought, well, maybe it's just a central location. There's a main little square down by the water. It's probably easy to find, and, and they probably didn't know where they would be, so let's just meet there. And, and then I thought, unless it's some Presbyterian ritual where you, you know, you to pray for the sins you're about to commit, and then you feel better about them. So, you know, I, I like, oh, well, I guess I'll find out. And so sure enough, we walked down from my little bed and breakfast down the little lane, and then there's the main town, and then there it is. You can't miss it. It's this massive, austere, brick, Protestant church right there, and it's very grand. And we walked up 7 o'clock on a Saturday night, and stood on the steps, and I'm just waiting, and, and, there's, and then here they come. Here's Nigel and about five or six of his buddies, and they come sauntering up, and it's like, great, well, all right, now wh wh where are we going? I'm like, oh, come on in. And we just, they walked right up past me, opened the massive wooden doors, and into the church we went. Now, it wasn't that we were going to pray before committing sins, and it wasn't the central location. We would be staying there all night. The thing is, this central church in Oban, the grandest, largest, old, I don't know about oldest, but one of the oldest, went out of business and has been converted into a pub. So we, and we went. The, the, it had been gutted. It was really cool. They'd done a great job. There were neat chandeliers, huge wooden tables, two, Celt two bands, one a Celtic funk band, a bar here. And we didn't leave. We were there till five in the morning when we went out for fish and chips. Amazing. Amazing. Now, this is happening all over Europe. And we're going to get to the United States, but I have to start in Europe here. Churches are going out of business. That same trip, two weeks later, went down to see friends in Cologne, Germany. Hear Gisbert on the phone. What are we going to do? No, no, no. Let's go to the church. Same deal. We went out, and there was a band and a party at the church. So this is happening all over. Churches are being turned into laundromats, pubs, <laughs> discos, apartments, duplexes. Consider for, uh, let me just give you some statistics here. I'm going to give you a few statistics, and then we'll get back to more, uh, 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 you know, analysis and stories. Back in the 1930s, so what I experienced in England is not just, you know, argument by anecdote, you always got to be careful. Oh, maybe this is the one-time deal. No. It reflects a sociological reality. Back in the 1930s, about 75% of British children were baptized. By 2006, only 14% were getting baptized. Back in 1900, less than 15% of British weddings were civil or secular in nature. Today, over two-thirds of, of weddings in Great Britain are secular or civil in nature. Back in the 19th century, about 60% of British adults attended church on any given Sunday. Today, fewer than 10% do. Back in, the, in 1900, 55% uh, of British children regularly attended Sunday school. Today, only 4% do. 4%. In fact, I don't know if you noticed this, but just a week ago, one of the cardinals of, of, of the, uh, not a Catholic cardinal, but like the Archduke of Canterbury or some British dude um, high up in the Church of England said, we have to admit we are a post-Christian society. It's over. Back in the 1950s, only 2% of British adults said they did not believe in God. That figure was up to 27% in the 90s. 37% in 2008, almost 40% saying they don't believe in God. We're seeing similar trajectories of secularization throughout Europe, in Scandinavia, in Slovenia, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in France, in Belgium. We're seeing similar radical secularization in other parts of the world, South Korea, Japan. Let's take Japan. 60 years ago, about 70% of the Japanese claimed to hold personal religious beliefs. Today, only about 20% of Japanese adults claim to hold any personal religious beliefs. When the new pope was anointed recently from South America. And then he went to Brazil. Big deal. Brazil's the, the, the largest Catholic nation in the world. And they were going crazy. But the big story was, number one, that Catholicism's going down in Brazil. Evangelical Pentecostal Christianity's on the rise. And guess what so else is? Non-religion. 8% of Brazilians now saying they have no religion. Now, 8% may, seem not, may not seem like much. In a country like Brazil, that's tens of millions of people in one of the most Catholic countries in the world. All right, so 
I could talk more and more about other countries in, in the Q&A. We can get to that. But what about us? Here we are. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was told that we were the great exception to the secularization theory, to the secularization reality, that yeah, maybe something's going on in Europe, but here we are in the United States, a wealthy, industrialized, modern democracy, and religion strong as ever. And this is the 90s, and so there was something to be said for that. Um, and yet, and yet, things have taken a, a different turn. Uh, I've been studying secular people for a while now, and my dad has an old friend who always likes to jab me. So every time I see him, he'll say, how's the secular, uh, no, he goes, how's the atheism business these days, Phil? And I'm just like, it's booming, Victor. It's booming. <laughs> Consider for the following. And again, sorry to bore you with statistics, but they do tell a story. The percentage of Americans who claim none, N-O-N-E, when asked what is their religion, was about 8% back in the 1990s, similar to Brazil today. Then it ticked up to 14% in 2001, and that was headline news. USA Today, Barry Cosman was all over the place. Then it ticked up even further. So today, it's at a low end, according to Pew, of 20%, and a high end of 30%, according to Wynne Gallup. So we've got several national polls between 20 and 30% of Americans saying they have no religion. And the percentage of Americans these things get asked differently, but who, who, when asked, are you religious, in, in, uh, uh, dropped from 73% in 2005 to 60% today. So we're seeing fewer and fewer Americans identifying as religious. In absolute numbers, about 660,000 Americans join the ranks, have joined the ranks of no religion every year in the last decade. So now somewhere between 38 and 45 million Americans say they have no religion, making no religion the fastest growing religious group, if you will, <laughs> in the country. And the only orientation, I don't know what to call it yet, the only religion growing in all 50 states, the non-religious category. Um, now, I always get this. Um, it's so funny how quickly people want to shoot this at me. I was just at Georgetown on a panel, um, and you know, right away it was being moderated by Cokie Roberts. You know, and I'm giving some of these statistics, and right away, right away they always say, well, they're not all atheists, you know. I'm like, yeah, I know, Cokie Roberts. Okay. But the American Religious Identification Survey, ARIS, headed uh, under the auspices of Barry Cosman, Ariel Kazar, goes into the nun population and asks them. So what do we find out? Somewhere between a third and half of all nuns, N-O-N-E-S's, are atheist or agnostic in orientation. Somewhere between a third and half. Now, why do I say in orientation? because most people don't like to take the label of atheist. So in the same questionnaire, you can ask someone, are you an atheist? They will say no. Five questions later, you can say, do you believe in God? They'll say no. <laughs> so you can ask people, are you an agnostic? They'll say no. Five questions later, you can say, do you believe in God? They'll say, not sure, or no one can say, it's impossible to know, or whatever. So in orientation, people are far more likely to be agnostic or atheistic in their worldview, but they just often uh, f are scared to own the label. Of those who say N-O-N-E, about a quarter believe in a higher power, and only about 20% say they believe in a personal God. So even, so this rise of nuns is in fact also an increase of atheism and agnosticism. It's not the same, but so if 25% of Americans are non-religious, we can guesstimate that probably between 10 and 15% are then atheistic and, or agnostic in orientation. And that's exactly what the Harris Poll finds. Harris Polls have found that somewhere between 9% at the low end and 21% at the high end of Americans are atheistic or agnostic in orientation. We've never seen these rates of non-belief in American history, ever. Now, I'm almost done. This is really exciting. The rates of secularity are markedly stronger among younger Americans. So if you just take that 18 to 29 demographic, those under 30, 32% say they're non-religious or have no religion. A third, a third. That's fascinating. And just to give you a sense, in the 1980s, among 20-somethings, among that 20-something group, twice as many said they were evangelical Christians as said they were not secular or non-religious. Today, that has flip-flopped. So that among 20-somethings today, 
twice as many say they have no religion compared to those who identify as evangelical Christian. Hallelujah. I, 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 I love it. Amen. Um, and then this is the last statistic I'm going to throw at you. This is from Pew. This is great. Of all these adults who said they're non-religious or have no religion or checked N-O-N-E when asked what is your religion, nearly 90% of those individuals say they have no interest in looking for a religion that might be right for them. So that's some of the questions. Are you, are you, you know, maybe you say none because you haven't found a church that's right for you or a faith that's right for you and you're looking. Hence, we shouldn't count you as secular. You're just a seeker. Over nine, uh, almost 90%, 89% saying they're happy the way they are, not being affiliated or identifying with a religion. So what's going on? How do we explain this? Well, thank you. I'll take questions now. No, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, it's so much easier to count, so much harder to explain what you find, right? Um, first, I should say that if we understand secularization as kind of the weakening of religion in society, the lessening of it, the marginalization of it, the, um, the decline of it, how do we explain that why that might happen? And what I would argue is we have to be careful because there may be like universal explanations. And by that I mean if X happens, it will create a decline in religion no matter what society we're looking at, right? It's kind of like a global universal explanation. You know, if, if this happens, it's always going to eat, eat away at religion. And then there's going to be more lo local or nation-specific or society-specific explanations, right? Something may be going on in a particular culture that explains why it is experiencing a decline in religion, which may not cause a decline in religion in a different culture, right? Um, so we have to be careful um, when describing these patterns. Are we, are we going to explain them in a sort of universalistic sense or more local uh, culture or nation specific sense? Because after all, the causes of secularization in Japan may not be the same thing as what has caused secularization in Uruguay or Estonia or Vietnam. There are very different societies, very different religious histories, very different demographics, politics, culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm going to do now is give um, what I would argue to be American-specific reasons for the American situation. And then we can talk about other societies if we want and other uh, uh, possibilities. So what are the factors that I think have ex help explain this real explosion of secularity in the United States in the last 25 years, a real boom? I'm going to give about seven not in any prioritized order. So I don't mean to argue that number one is the most significant, and number two, et cetera, et cetera. I'll let you tell me what you think is the most significant. And hopefully, I have missed some, and you'll give them to me, and I can incorporate them into my speech and do a better job. And I'll, I promise I'll give you credit. For starters, <clears throat> and I'm trying to give idea, uh, pre, uh, theories here that have, ha have some data to back them. It's, some of these are speculative, but they're based on some type of evidence, based on studies, be they surveys, interviews, or, or various uh, other uh, sources of data. For starters, we can talk about the, actually the success of the religious right and then the backlash that that success engendered. So the first thing that we notice is that you know back in the 1980s, you had the rise of such groups as the Moral Majority, the Christian Coalition. You had this growing closeness of conservative Republicans with evangelical Christianity. I'll never forget being in grad school at the University of Oregon, and the anti-gay rights movement was really just taken off. And one of my professors invited the head of the Oregon Citizens Alliance, a, e a Christian group whose main goal was to stop gay rights to come and speak to the class. And lo and behold, she was also the head of the Republican, the chair of the Republican Party of that county. And I thought, something's going on here. <laughs> Throughout the 90s and 2000s, more and more politicians on the right have embraced the conservative Christian agenda, and more and more outspoken, outspoken conservative Christians have aligned themselves with the Republican Party. This is not the Republicans of Gerald Ford. It's not even of Ronald Reagan. Right? This is a new amalgamation that's more overt. So from you know, Michelle Bachman to Ann Coulter, from Mike Huckabee to Pat Robertson, from Rick Santorin to James Dobson, Marco Rubio, we've got this, this, this 
emphasis on making abortion illegal, fighting against gay rights, particularly gay marriage, supporting prayer in school, advocating abstinence-only sex education, opposing stem cell research, curtailing welfare spending, supporting Israel, opposing gun control, and celebrating uh, the war on terrorism, etc., etc., etc. And this warm welcome of for evangelical Christians in the Republican Party sort of comes to its head under the presidency of George W. Bush, where we have this out evangelical. Remember when he was running for president, he was asked, who's your favorite philosopher? And he said, Jesus. And, you know, when he was about to invade Iraq, he was asked, you know, are, did you consult with your father about this? And he said, I consulted with a higher father. Um, so this was really, we had an evangelical Christian whose, whose, whose spiritual advisor was that guy out of uh, uh, Colorado, Colorado Springs, the, the president of American Evangelicals of America, uh, what was his name? He was the one that was having crystal meth with the gay prostitute. That was Bush's spiritual advisor who we spoke to once a week. What was his name? Haggard. Ha Ted Haggard, thank you. Okay, so what we have seen is that a lot of Americans didn't want to be associated with this. So a lot of moderate Americans, middle of the road politically, maybe even somewhat Republican, but not that kind of Republican, different kind of Republican. People who were middle of the road, mainline Christians, who maybe kind of had an affiliation with, you know, a United Methodist Church or, Congre you know, UCC, or just, you know, suddenly were like, if that's what being Christian is, I don't want to be identified with that. If that, I don't want to say I'm Christian because I don't want to be uh, thrown in together with the Ann Coulters. I'm not part of it. So as one sociologist, Mark Chavez, puts it, after 1990, more people thought that saying you were religious was tantamount to saying you were a conservative Republican. So people who are not Republicans now are more likely to say that they have no religion. <sighs> number two. So that's, been our, that's number one. Number two. Another reaction to something? A backlash against the Catholic Church's pedophile priest scandal. Uh, you're all aware of the horror uh, for decades and decades and decades. The higher-ups of the Catholic Church were reassigning known sexual predators to remote parishes rather than having them arrested and prosecuted. Um, we had brash, law-breaking, aggressive slandering of, of accusers, uh, willful cover-ups. Did you notice when the files came out about the diocese here in Los Angeles, they had decided to start corresponding with each other in Japanese, just to obfuscate it even more? Um, all with utter impunity, and the extent of this criminality is hard to over-exaggerate. Over 6,000 priests have now been credibly implicated in some form of sex abuse. 500 have been jailed, more victims uh, than one can imagine. And the rapes, the molestations, and the cover-ups have become widely publicized, and now the result is that a lot of Catholics have become ex-Catholics. For example, in New England, between 2000 and 2010, so in just 10 years, the Catholic Church lost almost 30% of its members in New Hampshire, over 30% of its members in Maine, and closed nearly 70 parishes, that's 25% of its total parishes, throughout the Boston area. Why Boston? Area, right? Absolutely. So to lose one in four parishes in the, in the epicenter of Catholic America is pretty staggering. Let's look at Massachusetts in general. In 1990, over 54% of Massachusetts residents identified as Catholics. By 2008, it was down to 39%. According to the American Values Survey from 2012, although nearly one-third of Americans report being raised Catholic, only 22% now currently identify as Catholic. A precipitous nationwide decline indeed. So a reaction to the religious right, a reaction to the horrors of the Catholic Church and their sex uh, pedophile scandal, Next, number three. Now, both one and two have something to do with religion and something to do with the strength of religion in society. And it's a reaction against the religious right, a reaction against the, the, uh, what was seen as a, the hein heinous actions of this powerful religious institution. Number three has nothing to do with religion at all. It's just one of those fascinating sociological things. That should be a serial, fascinating sociological things. <laughs> You could eat it, and on the back, this fact, you know, you could read the facts on the back. Okay, here we go. Check this out. 
This, this comes from a historian in England named Colin Brown who was trying to understand the statistics about Britain that I, talked, that I began with. I mean, the, 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 the massive uh, loss, uh, decline, and evaporation of Christianity. He was trying to understand it, and he was charting it very closely. When did it start? When did it really get into high gear? And what Colin Brown recognized was he noticed an interesting correlation. When more and more British women began to work outside the home, their religious involvement dropped, as did that of their husbands and children. It seems as though women have historically been the, been the ones to keep religion going in the home, to get the kids to say their prayers, to get the kids off to Sunday school, to get Homer Simpson off the couch and over to church. <laughs> I mean, the Simpsons got it right. You know, Marge is the one that really is, you know, you know, Homer has, the kids have to be dragged there. Well, what's interesting is Scandinavia has the lowest rates of church attendance in the history of Christianity. Right now, they have the lowest rates of church attendance in the world, and they currently have the highest rate of women in the paid labor force in the history of the Western world. Just correlations, but it's really, really interesting. And then, lo and behold, we get data for here in the United States. Back in the 1960s, only 11% of Americans of American households, I should say, relied on a woman as the biggest or sole source of income, 11% back in the 1960s. Today, over 40% of American households rely on a woman for their main or sole or biggest breadwinner. Staggering sociological shift. And suddenly, we're seeing less and less people going to church, less and less people being identified as religious. It could be that as women work, you know, there could be two things going on, or more, but the two would be, one, when you're working outside the home, you're too tired for religion. It becomes suddenly not something you're going to have the energy for. Or number two, when you're making money outside of the home, you feel empowered, you feel like you have some agency, you have some choice in your life, and maybe those things are inimical, inimical to uh, uh, religious faith or whatnot. Number four, the increased acceptance of homosexuals and homosexual rights in American culture. Since the days of Stonewall and Harvey Milk, more and more Americans have come to accept homosexuality as a normal, legitimate form of loving and pairing. And we see now that those Americans who continue to malign homosexuality as sinful or immoral and who continue to fight against gay rights do so exclusively exclusively from a religious vantage point. There is no organized secular voice against gay rights or gay marriage. Quite the opposite. Secular Americans are the most supportive of gay rights and gay marriage, right? And that support declines each, the more religious you get. So moderate religious people are a little less supportive. Strongly religious people, the most against gay rights. Oops. So, um, this again is, could just be a coincidence. But if we look at what demographic in American society is most supportive of gay rights, it's the 20-somethings, those between 18 and 30. And what demographic has the right, highest rates of secularity? As we've already seen, the 20-somethings, 32% saying they have no religion. Again, these could be just totally coincidentally you know, appearing. I, I believe there is some kind of connection, some type of, of strong correlation. Number five, a reaction against 9-11. I think 9-11, the terrorist attacks on 9-11 really got a lot of Americans thinking. This is what caused Sam Harris's book, The End of Faith, to become an, a national bestseller, followed by God Delusion, followed by God is Not Great. I'm not so sure those books would have been such huge bestsellers had it not been for 9-11. They might have been. They might have been. But, you know, there had been atheist voices. I mean, Madeline Murray O'Hare was writing books for years, for decades, that never became uh, such big bestsellers. There was something about America was hungry for something to critique and, 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 and uh, this religious fanaticism that caused so much destruction. And, and, and yes, most of it was focused on Islam, and, you know, critiques of Islam exploded. Islamophobia has grown a bit. Um, but, and, and in the wake of 9-11, there was a kind of, you know, people turn to religion for comfort, so there was a kind of flocking to the churches, but that petered out within months, the, and, and attendance went right back, or even lower to what it once was before 9-11, and I think it got a lot of people thinking, religion has some danger to it. 
Um, and those of us probably in this room have known that all along. But I think it got your average you know, couch potato American to go, hmm, and take a skeptical look. Number six, more cultural level, what I would call irreligion and entertaining impiety on TV. There have been, there are these very successful comedians wearing their uh, uh, irreligiosity on their sleeves, lampooning religion, mocking it night after night after night. Bill Maher, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, who himself, they say he's a Catholic, but my goodness, he's, he makes fun of religion. In fact, before he had his own show, I don't know if you remember, but he was on Jon Stewart, and he would do like the weak in God or whatever and mock religion. Um, Penn uh, pen of, uh, of, of Penn and Teller, uh, Penn Jillette, and then you've got a lot of t television shows not just headed by a secular American willing to mock religion and to do so repeatedly and in a very witty way, but you have these shows that do it as well. South Park which the younger generation has eaten up uh, uh, like you wouldn't believe, ha constantly mocks religion. The Simpsons, House, Family Guy, this may be affecting American culture. And there's no equivalent on the evangelical Christian side, right? There's no smart, sharp, charismatic, funny talk show host that has wide appeal in American culture. Um, there are, they are on the radio, you know, you can hear them, um, and that's always fun. Uh, but you don't have these type of television shows uh, that, are, that are on the other side. You get films like Noah, but nothing with the bite. And finally, number seven, the internet. I would argue that the internet has had a secularizing effect on society in recent decades. And this hap happens on various levels. First off, religious people can look up their own religion on the web and suddenly, even unwittingly, be exposed to an array of critiques and blatant attacks on their tradition that they otherwise probably would have never come across. In the old days when you looked up a book, you went to the section that, you know, you went to the religion section, or you went to the Catholic section, or the Buddhist section, or whatever, and, or the Jewish section, and you found the book you were looking for, and you read it. Now you look up any religion, be, be careful. You're going to see critiques, attacks, not just other websites, but in the comments. So debunking on the internet abounds, whether you're Mormon, Scientologist, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, whatever it is, the web exposes the adherence of every, any and every religious tradition to skeptical views that can potentially undermine a person's surety, uh, rattling an otherwise insulated, confident conviction in one's religion. We see evidence of this. For example, Linda Lascola and Daniel Dennett have a new book out. Um, I forget what it's called, but it's based on their clergy project work where they uh, started a website for employed clergy who no longer believed, but had to pay a mortgage, you know? This is their job. And, you know, how they struggle with that, how that works. And they created a, an anonymous website where they could talk to each other and connect with each other. And then they've been able to conduct, conduct in-depth interviews. And what Linda has found is that some of these pastors and ministers talk about using the internet as a factor of their emergent atheism or agnosticism. In other words, eh, they had to give a sermon one week. It was going to be on a certain passage. They looked it up to get some background information, and there is all kinds of skeptical voices, debunking voices, and it causes them to revisit some of this stuff that maybe they hadn't thought about in a long time and planted some doubt. I've even read uh, a, an interesting study. This was great. Hella Winston is an anthropologist. She went in to study the most secretive, cut-off Hasidic Jews, not the Lubavitchers, not the ones that light menorahs all over town and stuff like that. These are the Sotmars that are up in, in some part of Brooklyn or Crown Heights, I don't know. They're not interested in converting anybody. They're not interested in talking to anybody, even other Jews that are outside their little sect. She got involved with them for just to study them, and what she found was some of them were leaving, living secret or double lives. They were crossing the bridge, taking off their garb, putting on secular clothing, and going to concerts, going to bar, you know, having a good time. But the real mechanism was the web. This is how they were finding out about this bigger, wider world and how they were connecting to other ex-Hasidic Jews, and, and which leads to the next, uh, uh, the next aspect in which the internet is helping. If you were 
living in Alabama and your folks were Pentecostal and your, your neighbors were, everybody was religious and you were some 19-year-old or 39-year-old or 69-year-old individual and you started to have doubts. You know, before the internet, what could you do with those doubts? You were surrounded by religion. Every, your whole social support was religious. Everybody you knew. So, you know, buck up. I mean, either you're going to like be ostracized and have no life or you're just going to try and quell those doubts and, and, and wish them away or just try not, not to harbor on them. Now, within a few taps on the keyboard, you're connecting with someone one county over, maybe a mile away, maybe 10,000 miles away, but you have an instant ability to learn more, nurture your doubts, nurture your skepticism, and connect with other people. So not only does it provide more information, but it allows you to feel some support and some social support, which is so crucial, so crucial, if you ever really are going to have a change of worldview. It's not so easy to have a change of worldview because we tend to associate with people who share our worldview. So when your worldview starts to shift and you're looking at no family, no friends, uh, that's not such a great possibility, but the internet allows for you to have at least a sense of some kind of social support, some type of, of, of comfort. But I would say there's maybe something even a little deeper here. I would argue that the internet, not just by what it allows you to do, but what it is in and of itself, how it functions, I would argue that the entertainment available on the internet the barrage of imagery, the simultaneity, the mental stimulation, the looking and clicking, the hunting and finding, the time wasting, the consumerism, the constant social networking, the individualism it, 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 it fosters, the virtual communication, all of it, all of it may simply be undermining re religion's ability to hold our interest, draw our attention, or tap our soul. Religion is a bit of a relic. Back in the day, when most people were illiterate, when most people lived in rural situations far from each other, religion provided social networking, community, information, entertainment, stories. That all is being sapped by all the other ways in which we can get these things. And now the internet has taken it to another level that I think is just simply making religion less interesting psychologically and socially to younger Americans or all Americans. And we see a correlation between internet usage and secularity the world over. Again, they're just correlations, hard to say what's causing what, or maybe they're both being caused by some third variable, but we're seeing that. Those would be my best guesses. I want to end on what I think are some potential consequences for the rise of the nuns, and then we'll open it up for Q&A and discussion, or we can get on our iPads. Okay, um, so um, I think there are a lot of really good consequences to all of this. So I'm very, this is all exciting news to me, it makes me very happy, but it's not all good. I don't wanna, uh, I, I don't wanna be totally uh, thinking, oh, we're just gonna, you know, ride off into some secular paradise and everybody will be rational and all the world's problems will be solved from, from uh, you know, I'm not so sure. What I do know is that wherever secularism is strong, women's rights improve. So even, even, in, even in the less savory examples like the Soviet Union, you know, the Soviet Union was a, was a rabidly secular experiment. They, they had the League of Militant Atheists, which was supported by the, 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 the fascistic government to go out and deconvert people and destroy religion and arrest religious leaders and destroy churches and icons. I mean, this was a rabidly secularist agenda here. Even in that situation, which was so heinous on so many levels, such an abuse of human rights, women's status improved significantly. So wherever, so from the worst type of secularism to the best, most benign type, like what we might see in Scandinavia, so whatever kind of secularism, there's a strong correlation between the increase, increase of women's rights. I got to digress here. This is just too good of a story. We're, my family's Jewish. We're culturally Jewish. And we like r uh, rites of passage. I think those are important. So my daughter, uh, wants to have a bat mitzvah. We're not members of a synagogue, so she's having a kind of humanist bat mitzvah. So she's, <laughs> she's taking some of the, we want her to read the Hebrew, because that's just what, what you have to accomplish. Learn that Hebrew, learn how to chant it. Got to read from the Torah. After that, she can do whatever she wants. She's bringing in song lyrics. She's bringing in poetry. So we're kind of scrapping prayers that she doesn't like, or replacing them, or rewriting them, or whatever. But the thing with the Torah portion is, it's, 
you know, Jews read the first five books of Moses throughout the year, and then you start over again. So each week you read a little passage of the first five books of Moses. And whatever, whenever your bar or bat mitzvah is, that's the passage you read, whatever is being read then. So you don't get to pick your passage. So she got her Torah portion, and her Torah portion is what men should do when they suspect their wives of cheating on them. And do you know what they should do? Throw them in the river. If they drowned, they were guilty. If they float, they were innocent. But wait, if there are some witnesses to the infidelity and your wife still insists it's not true, the priest will make a wonderful elixir full of bile and blood and dirt and God knows what else. It is God commanding this. And she is to drink it. If she dies, she was guilty. If she survives, she's innocent. My daughter's freaking out about this. <laughs> and she's like, w and you're supposed to give a speech on it. And we read it together, and I just looked at her and said, this is heinous. There's no good aspect to this. You know, usually in a Torah portion, you can find something. Like, you know, there was a battle. Okay, the battle's bad, but you can talk about this or that. Or, you know, and I even said to her, you know, there are passages in the Torah about justice. There are passages about charity. There are passages about love. There are passages about, you know, existential wonder, all that. Sh it's heinous. And so I said to her, maybe you can make your speech about progress and how far we've come. And my teenage daughter walked in the room and said, we haven't come very far. What are you talking about? They're still stoning women to death for this. Heavy stuff. Women's rights improve and will improve with the rise of the nuns. We can also expect more and expanding rights for gays and lesbians, which seems to, again, come from secularism and secular values and secular ideals. I anticipate greater political power for secular Americans. I think David Niosi's book is spot on. There's going to be a time very soon when politicians are going to say, can we really do that? We don't want to piss off the secular chunk of America. The way they used to talk about the evangelicals or the religious right. Oh, we can't do that. The religious right won't like it. That's changing, very much so. You know, Barack Obama in his first inauguration mentioned we're a nation of Muslims and Jews and Christians, et cetera, and non-believers. And that was the first time a president had ever mentioned non-believers, let alone in an inauguration. Now, what, what do we see following that? Um, what was it? The Secular Coalition of America was able to meet with President Obama's administration in a lobbying get-together, the first time that's ever happened. Things are changing. When I was at Georgetown on this panel, the Archduke Bishop Cardinal or whatever gave the opening address and said something along the lines of, well, we're here to discuss this and that, and we need to listen to all viewpoints, including those of non-believers and atheists. You know, and I'm thinking, progress is being made. I mean, you would have never heard that 10 years ago, certainly not 20, 30 years ago. So I believe that our political muscle is going to strengthen, which is going to Im improve our ability to solve the world's problems rationally, scientifically, with empirical evidence, and not uh, you know, pray for crime rates to go down or something like that. So I see a lot of good. I also have some worries. Number one, there's a strong correlation between secularism and individualism. We're not big joiners. We're not big, we don't have big social network circles. So I do worry that with the rise of people opting out of religion, um, where are we gonna find community? We're social animals, we have evolved as social animals, where are we gonna find that social bonding? And if you think about the internet, it's a very solitary, I, I believe it's a very um, anti-social activity, to be sure. Next, and I'll end here, and it does relate to my daughter's bar mitzvah, what of rituals, traditions, and heritage? I mean, these things are part of the human experience. These are things that are part of human culture. And I understand not everybody needs them, but most humans require or love or enjoy uh, life transition rituals that help us move through life to acknowledge there's something about tradition that links us to future generations and past generations, right? To do a certain tradition or ritual that you know your grandparents and great-grandparents did and your grandchildren and great-grandchildren will also do. There's strength in that. There's beauty in that. So I do wonder what we're going to do as because religion's been the main provider of that all these years. Will we find secular alternatives? I assume so. 
but it's not so clear how this is all going to work out. So I'm worried a bit about how we're going to maintain communal bonds and social bonds, and we know that when social networking is high, society thrives, crime rates stay low, people are healthier and happier when they're socially integrated. Um, in fact, being socially isolated is one of the number one predictors of suicide. So we are social animals, and I wonder how will we replace these religious rituals and traditions to create a sense of meaning and heritage that's transgenerational. Will we secularize religious rituals? Will we create new ones? Uh, I'm not so sure. But these are some of the things that keep me up at night. Thank you so much for listening. Let's have Q&A. OK, how do you want me just to call on people? Yeah, all right. Um, let's start in the back there with the uh, green scarf. Um, two things. Can we have people, can you repeat the questions? You so bet. I'll opinion? repeat the question to my best ability. And well, please keep the question short. Uh, do you agree with uh, some of the, uh, what some people are writing about that in secular countries, you know, mm -hmm. like in Europe and Scandinavia, they, they have better health care, they have you know, uh, the U.S., for example, is way down there on a whole bunch of things. You know, child immortality, infant mortality, infant mortality, and all kinds of other stuff. We're down there with some of the most uh, underdeveloped countries. You bet. So the question was about this relationship between more secular societies having healthier societies in terms of standard measures of health, hair care, inequality, uh, et cetera, et cetera, whereas the United States does so poorly compared to these countries. So absolutely, there's a strong correlation between societal health and organic secularism. I, I'm calling organic secularism the kind of secularism that isn't uh, driven by the barrel of a gun. So I don't mean when atheist dictators like Pol Pot take over society and stamp out religion. I mean free, open, democratic societies whereby religion withers on its own without anybody forcing it to happen. People just opt out, freely choosing so. In those societies, be it Japan, be it Scandinavia, be it Uruguay, um, they tend to have uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, much better uh, indicators of societal health. Lower crime rates, longer life expectancies, lower infant mortality rates. In fact, on every single measure of societal health, whether it's STD rates, obesity rates, poverty rates, et cetera, et cetera, with the exception of suicide, they do, they do much better. So absolutely that's the case. In the United States, of course, we have the worst violent crime rates, the worst murder rates, greatest inequality between rich and poor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a strong correlation there. What causes what is up for debate? Do societies sort of become stronger and healthier and, and fight their pro social problems, and then when they do so successfully, religion withers? Or is it that when people become more secular, they are better at solving this world problems? So it's a chicken and egg debate. I know which side I tend to fall on it, but I would agree that as long as the United States is racked by societal ills, we're going to see stronger religion here than in other parts of the world. In the back, in the blue. There's been a major rise in uh, right-wing neo-fascist, neo-Nazi operations and separatist movements. In the United States, since Obama took over, it's been an explosion in right-wing, militant, violent, neo-Nazi groups in the United States. You've ignored completely these reactionary aspects happening worldwide without even mentioning the rise of Al-Qaeda and what's going on in Africa and the Middle East. Where's the connection there? Are you, in effect, saying that the reduction in religion equals the rise of fascist, fascist elements? Good question. Um, I would say I see a bifurcation. I see a situation where religion is becoming either more extreme and dangerous and violent, or it's weakening and withering away. So when I look at, for example, let's take the Middle East. A lot of those societies, 40, 50 years ago, let's take a place like Lebanon, were quite secular. Iran, very secular. In fact, in the 1950s and 60s, Iran was probably the most secular country in all of Islam. I don't know. I, I shouldn't say that. I don't know much about Malaysia. But um, very secular country, very Western-looking country, suits and ties. Look at Turkey with Ataturk. I mean, this guy was strongly, proudly, fiercely secular. Yes, he was Muslim in a sort of cultural heritage sense. Unless you're an Armenian or a Greek, yes. Say it again. Unless you're an Armenian or a Indeed. Greek, they killed three million. Indeed. Yeah. Heinous crime. I, I, I don't know what to say about that other than how horrifying what the Turks did to Armenia. But, I, but, but 
you're, 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 th- you're shooting buckshot here. I, I, I can't. <laughs> I'm, you're all over the map here. I'm trying to stay focused. Yes, what the Turks did to Armenians, the first horrific genocide of the 20th century. Adolf Hitler cited it in his, as an example of what he could get away with. when he. So, yes, that's bad. That fact still remains that he set Turkey on a very secularist course in many ways, including women's rights. So what I would argue is that, um, that we see those, many of those societies now, Islam's on the rise in Turkey. Islam's on the rise in, in, in Iran, or has been. Who knows what's going on now? But so I think these are all, it's, I don't even know how we can address all these simultaneously. I was ad- asked to speak on the rise of the nuns here in the United States. And as for those right-wing groups you're talking about, I'm not so sure they're religiously motivated. I think they're nationalistic. I think they're ethnocentric. I think they're hostile to Islam. But I'm not so sure like that the Le Pen movement in France is motivated by faith in Jesus. I'm not so sure these right-wing freaks in the United States, are, and these neo-Nazis, are motivated by religion. So I'm not quite sure how they connect. There is a reaction against something, but I think they're far more terrified of having an African-American president than they are you know, out to, to push God or something like that. Skeptic. Do it under peer review. Do it under peer review, <laughs> yes. Um, this connects to that other question a little bit. Um, early in your talk, you stumbled a little bit over whether we should call the nuns a, a religious group mm-hmm. or something. Um, but then you use the term worldview several yeah. times in your talk, or you could also say a philosophy. Yeah. Um, there is, there are religious outfits that want to call atheism a religion. Mm. But do you think it's useful to turn it around and say, no, religion is just one of competing worldviews or philosophies, <coughs> which a marginalizes it. Yeah. B allows us to say fascism, that authoritarianism are bad, whether they're religious or secular. Right. I like that a lot. I'm, a, I'm, of, I'm of the same mind. I think that's really, really helpful and really useful. You bet. Uh, thank you. Well, it's in terms of how we want to characterize uh, uh, what we're talking about. And earlier I had said that the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, is where the fastest growing, quote, religion, for lack of a better word, um, and I don't really think we should call secular people a religion. So I had then gone on to talk about it as a worldview. Um, Frank Pasquale talks about worldviews and life ways as a way to capture uh, this phenomenon. And I, I agree with you that we can talk about worldviews. Religion can be one among many, but it makes religion have its own little place among the broader uh, 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 um, uh along the broader banner of worldviews. So I definitely like that a lot and will use it more and more. I certainly don't like calling atheism a religion or secularism a religion. I think that's BS, and I think that's a way people try to malign us and, and so on and so forth. Okay, yes, in the glasses. Okay, um, as a teacher, um, I've seen a lot of reaction to the teaching of creationism in school. Would you consider that as a contributing factor to secularism? Ooh, okay, people reacting negatively against the, cre- the teaching of creation in, in school. Absolutely. I would argue that the religious right has many tentacles, and so one is in the governmental realm, one might be in women's rights and re- re- reproductive rights, but certainly one of their more um, successful tentacles has been to infiltrate school boards, infiltrate, dominate the Texas publishing industry where our textbooks are published and to get creationism pushed in schools. And I do think there's been a backlash. I do think there, that that's pissed off a lot of parents. Rightly so. It's, un, it's, it's, it's unbelievable and embarrassing and shameful, isn't it? It's hard to really wrap our brain around that this is even a conversation. It's incredible. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a little surprised that uh, on your list of, you gave a list of seven reasons uh, you didn't have uh, the fact that over the past, I don't know, 75 years, a lot more people go to college. Oh. You know, and I mean, just the fact that by going to college, you're stepping out of your parochial That's environment, true. and you're going to take the odd philosophy or history or sociology course, and I, 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 I'm thinking as an occupational group, you know, college professors, there's not a lot of them that on Sunday they go to a church where they handle snakes and stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. 
I, don't you think the fact that that what they call university in England, because you studied statistics in England, yeah, uh, what we call, call the fact that more people go to college, and the, the figure is staggering. People don't realize in 1934 percent of people went to college, mm -hmm. and now it's 40 percent or so, mm -hmm. some sort of college. Yeah. So yeah. isn't that a factor in the yeah. rise of secularism? Fair enough. Fair enough. Education is a factor in the rise. So thank you for that. Let me let me say what I agree with, and then maybe try to give some excuse as to why I didn't include it. So, which may or may not fly. So, what I would say is, in my own research, I have found people citing going to college as a, as a pretty prominent reason in, in what contributed to their loss of faith. So, in fact, my book, Faith No More, where I just interviewed a bunch of people that were religious but then lost their faith, I interviewed about 90 people and tried to see what patterns emerged. That was one of them. People talked about, and you're absolutely spot on. It was taking, it was taking that, that philosophy class, but not only that philosophy class, it was taking that religious studies class that really got them thinking, even at Christian colleges. I interviewed people that were, you know, even went to specifically Christian colleges and took these. So you're absolutely right that religion, not only what you're learning, but getting away from home, meeting other people, all of that is a contributing factor at that micro individual level that I was able to ascertain in my in-depth interviews. There is also some thing to be said about more educated populations tend to be more secular. That's, so that's to acknowledge and affirm what you've said. The, the problem I'm finding is the latest data that I'm seeing, particularly from Barry Cosman's national surveys, the American Religious Identification Survey, is having a very difficult time now showing any correlation between educational attainment and secularity. That, at the United States level, has disappeared. Because so many more people are going to college now, it's, we're not able to see, so, so evangelicals, Catholics, and so on and so forth, there's not a significantly lower rate of college education among them compared to secular people, and secular people are not uh, college graduates at a significantly higher level, and that's new. So in the last five years, so it's made me hesitant to present that. What I will say is self-identified atheists and agnostics have far, are far more likely to be higher educated. But among the N-O-N-E population, that 20% that to 30% that said I'm non-religious, they don't graduate from college in any significantly higher levels than religious Americans. So, let's see, yes in the silver purse. You, yes. Oh, okay, your last comment about life transitions and you are concerned about some of that going away. I urge you to give thought to the possibility that an awful lot of that really does, in practice, relate to age discrimination. You stop doing this and you start doing that. Uh, somebody in Greece way back when said education was wasted on the young. And um, uh, if you are going to school when you are 70 years old, you are possibly more likely to be less conservative and more open to the things that we're talking about. I know what you just said here. But um, you, you, we don't think so much in terms of age discrimination like we do in sex discrimination, uh, which is the closest to it. But I urge you to start doing that. And even maybe that'll help you let go of bad solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Yes. Have you encountered a better term than atheist? It's hard to be for something that's defined as against. Absolutely. And uh, I wonder if, if you have any thoughts about yeah. a better uh, term. A lot of people don't like the term atheist because it's defining yourself by what you don't believe or is against something. It's, it's actually privileging theist and saying, well, I'm not that, which w is an odd way to say what you are. So the best alternatives to that that I have found are, number one, to say I'm a secular humanist. So that says I'm secular, and I believe in the goodness of human beings and in the potential of humans to, to solve the world's problems. So I like secular humanist a lot. Um, another one that I have come across um, is, an, is called an awist, A-W-E. Some guy came up with this idea that, you know, you stand in awe 
at the wonder of being. You don't say what's behind it all. You don't believe in a god or a magic deity, but you, you experience a sense of awe at the mystery tremendum that is existence. And so if you want to say what you are, well, I'm an awist. It's a little bit hard to pronounce. And no one knows what the heck it is. But that's my best guess. Uh, I like naturalist. Yeah, you bet. I'm just, I was never good in biology, so, but yeah, that's a good one. Um, yes, and then direct middle. Don't you think that the single most important thing that you said today was the fact that there's no real way for people who are not religious, and it's hard to get away from religion because it's just a cap like a chair. There's a dinner chair and then there's an electric chair. You just got to find a new way to express it. I think not being against something is why people try to hang their, it's a religion. Mm. And mm. Because for, it, it's just a word. Mm. Mm. But not having a community for people who feel this way, one of the things that religion, if you will, or the community that it creates is it's how peer pressure is why your grandmother didn't go out and steal from her neighbor was because someone would see her. There was a sense of community. Mm. And without that, in, in, in this lack of or, or, or faith in people, you've got to have a faith in something. You're either, you know, it's either up there or it's yourself mm -hmm. and the people around you. You have to instill morality in some way. And mm -hmm. as a group is the only way you keep. Mm -hmm. Many of the young people who don't believe in anything just don't believe in anything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a downside to that. Yeah. That, that building of the yeah. community is really important. And the internet is not going to do it because yeah. I can see your face. Yeah, I think community is... is Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, is kind of the definitive, definitive articulation about this. And there's so many strong correlates between when there's strong social networks in a society, what they call social capital, when we, there's social integration, uh, a host of benefits come with that. And when people are isolated, there's a lot of problems. So I agree. You know, we're not all s as social as everybody else. I mean, some people, my wife's a little less social than I am, or all oh, that's changing over these years. But, but you're right. We have to figure something out on that front. Yes, sir. Something that's worked well for me on that, when somebody asks my position, I say, I am evidence-based, fact-based, science-based, and I follow the evidence wherever it leads. And better evidence will change my mind. Show me some, and I'll be a Christian tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for that. Well said. Right here. Okay, I would love to get your opinion on this because we're t you're talking about nuns. And so, like, for example, my friends list on Facebook, I have a lot of friends who classify themselves as atheist agnostics. Okay. I have a number of friends who classify themselves in different religious groups. But I don't know how to wrap my head around people who classify themselves as spiritual. spiritual. Okay? <laughs> and, and I think maybe in title, they might be different than you know a non-believer like myself. Okay. But I don't see how in practice their life is any different than a non-believer's. Or a nun, I guess. Yeah. That the question is about people who lay themselves many things, among them spiritual. Some will even say I'm spiritual but not religious. Um, I have to say, I get it. I, I'm a little sympathetic to it. Uh, I'll give you an example of someone I interviewed. This is a person whose family is Catholic. You know, grandparents came over from Italy. Uh, parents were very Catholic. This individual at a young age lost that belief in that. Didn't like the tradition. Didn't believe the dogma. Didn't believe any of the teachings. Didn't believe in the Eucharist. Didn't believe in any of it. Didn't, did not believe in the Bible, did not believe in, that Jesus died for his sins, didn't believe in heaven and hell and purgatory and any of it, in any way, shape, or form. However, she does believe that there is something out there greater than evidence, facts, science, reason. She won't put a label on it. She won't call it God. She, so she's not a member of the Catholic Church. She's not Catholic. She And she associates that with religion. She's not religious. She doesn't go to a church. She doesn't donate. There's nothing she does that a religious person does. And yet, she feels, she feels as though there is an energy or a spiritual force or a vibe that is on another level. Now, so she doesn't feel like saying I'm an atheist. She doesn't feel like saying I'm a skeptic or a humanist or a naturalist or a materialist or, a, or totally secular. She taps into this every now and then. So 
I don't know. I, I, I can see how hardcore secular folks will look at that as like wishy-washy, weird. But you got to grant people their subjective realities. Not that they're true in an objective sense, but subjectively, it's how she, she feels. So I know a lot of people like that. They, they, they feel as though there's something more out there. They don't want to call it. They don't want to see themselves as religious. Um, and we could say they are if we want to, or we could just allow them to call themselves spiritual. Um, but I guess, yeah, that's my best guess. It's not really an opinion. Um, and I guess for me, if you want the opinion, there's a spectrum of those that call themselves spiritual. So there's this one side that's like into crystals and cards and gurus and, 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 and wants to share the light with you. And that's, of course, very uh, uh, taste, uh, distasteful for me. And then there's the kind that keep it to themselves, but if pushed will say, well, I'm not really an atheist. Do you believe in God? Well, depends how I define God as this loving energy. You know, so they're not defining a biblical God. So those kind, those kind of folks, I don't have an issue with, you know, but so. That's an say it again? Aulist. Yeah, I'm an aulist. Yes. Um, the other night, Lawrence Krauss was asked why he thought America was as religious as we are and other countries are not. And he, said something to the effect of, well, we don't have a national religion like the Church of England and UK. I said, what are your comment on that? And, and also, kind of related to that, how do you attribute the uprise in mega churches in this country? Mm -hmm. Do you think it has something to do with the closing, which is much less talked about, of these smaller regional churches? Yeah. All right, let me take the first one. So, um, basically, this comes from the work of guys like Rodney Stark and Roger Finke when they were trying to explain why was the United States more religious than Europe, basically. They weren't talking about Japan or Nepal or other countries, but Europe. And what they noticed was that in societies where you have a national church that is tax subsidized, um, that is, that is uh, uh, pretty much has a monopoly over the religious economy, if you will, um, those societies, a couple things happen. In the 17 and 1800s, when radicals and revolutionaries and pro-democracy forces and pro-liberty forces were, tr were angry at the state, that meant they were angry at religion as well because the state and religion were tied and linked. If you look at the situation in France, for example, the ancient ancien regime was religion and government together, right? It's the, look at your chessboard. It's, it's the bishops right there next to the king and the queen. And so if you wanted to be against the state, and by the state we meant the royalty, you automatically were against the clerics as well because they were in bed together. In the United States, it's true, historically, since we did not have a, uh, there's no United States, Church of the United States, you can be angry at the government, that doesn't mean you're angry at religion. Right? It's not, we don't see those as the same thing. But in Europe, they were often the same thing. So that's one angle. Another angle is, that some people would argue when you had a national monolithic monopoly type church situation like the Lutheran churches of Scandinavia, for example, religion grew stale, old, and boring. And there wasn't a thriving, vibrant religious marketplace. Here in the United States, since we don't have a tax-subsidized religious institution that's governmentally supported, all religions have to sink or swim on their own, which means they follow the principles of market capitalism. They have to get people to come to their church to pay for their building, to pay for the pastor, to pay for the... So they have to be competitive and uh, attractive, and they have to have flat screen TVs and dynamic pastors and great rock bands and child care. They'll do whatever... They advertise. They'll do whatever it takes, just like a pizza place or a tire company. or you know, I get stuff in the mail. They'll put up billboards. I mean, it's a marketing campaign, and, and we know all company, all, all capitalists, you know, the advertising is the number, the biggest pie of their budget. So some would argue that Religion is not marketed to such a degree in Europe because you have these old, lazy national churches that didn't have to market because they were the only show in town and they were supported by taxes. Here in the United States, you have a free religious marketplace and it creates a much more vital and, and, and bubbly and effervescent situation. So those are both possible. Those are both possible. It doesn't always work. I mentioned Nepal. Nepal has a state nationalistic church Everybody's very religious, right, in, in Hindu. Utah, every, you know, the Mormon church has a virtual monopoly. It's very religious there. So you can see a lot of countries where there is a national church that are still very religious. So it's, it's hard to say. 
Oh, the mega churches. How do we account for them? Is that the question? Oh, it's, yeah, mega churches are an American phenomenon. Although the biggest mega church is in South Korea, um, and that's an American import as well. Yeah, mega churches to me is, I, I see that as just capitalist innovation at its best. It's just the Walmartization of religion. It's just, let's just have a, people love, people love big edifices. I was invited to a mega church outside of Sacramento. It was unbelievable. It was a massive compound. You drove up this huge driveway. There were greeters everywhere, huge buildings, many, it was a huge complex, and and I, I kicked the guy's ass in a debate, so that was fun. But, um, but yes, I think mega churches are just America. Go big. Go for well. Yeah. That, but, but, I mean, there's obviously more to it than that. It's just not my area of expertise. So, yes, sir, and then you're next in the white. Yes. Uh, why do uh, secular societies tend to have a higher rate of uh, suicide? Okay, suicide. So, more secular societies tend to have higher suicide rates, um, absolutely. Places like Hungary, Finland, Japan. So, how do we explain this? This goes back to the founder of sociology, David Emile Durkheim from France, uh, who was the great genius that really gave birth to modern sociology, and one of his first studies was suicide. And he tried to look at all the reasons that different societies had different suicide rates, and he tried to take in all the factors he could, and what he ultimately found was uh, when you're more integrated, societies that are more integrated, what he called social density, have lower suicide rates. Where people are isolated, they tend to have higher suicide rates. And you can correlate this in a number of ways. Let's take wealth. Rich people have rich people across the globe have far higher suicide rates than poor people. Every time. Why? Well, when the goal of being rich is to isolate yourself from other humans. <laughs> That's why you want to be rich. So. If you're poor, you live in a situation where there's people all around you. You live in a tenement or an apartment complex or something so there's people above you, below you, next to you, and you can see them and hear them. You can hear them brush their teeth and flush their toilet. You can, they're, they're all around. If you get a little bit of money, you can move out of that situation to maybe a duplex. So you just have someone right next to you. If you get a little bit more money, you can buy an actual house. You still have neighbors and they're all around. If you get a little bit more money, you can buy a house with maybe, you know, no one's, you've got a nice backyard. So maybe there's people here and here, but not there. You get a little bit more money, you can buy a house that's actually up its own private driveway. So there are still houses near you, but you don't have to see any of them. And if you get really rich, you buy a, a mansion on top of a hill. And then if you get, and then the ultimate goal of all, every rich person is to buy their own island. So the whole point is to get away from humans. When you, um, when you travel, if you're poor, you're going to travel with a lot of people. You're standing in lines at the at Greyhound bus station. You're going to be sitting people in a bus or in a plane. But if you're kind of rich, you can fly. And if you're a little bit richer, you can fly in first class, which separates you from the bulk of the masses. But if you're really, really rich, of course, you have your own private jet. So the whole point of being rich is to get away from people. And when you finally get your island, then you kill yourself. And so, um, so then you're, you know, so that's how it works. So. Um, so there is an interaction with wealth and, and being alone. So, for example, Durkheim discovered that married people have lower suicide rates than single people. People with kids have lower suicide rates than people with no kids. People that, I mean, it was just about social integration on every variable. So it seems as though, as I said, we don't understand why, but secularism and individualism seem to go hand by hand. And by that we mean highly secular societies also tend to be highly individualistic, valuing individual autonomy to make choices, to participate in this or that or not. Um, we look at lives as our own. We are the master of our own fate. We make their own choices we want. If we don't want to do that, we don't have to. If we don't, we don't, there's the notion we marry whoever we want, who gives a shit what our parents say. We, we, we raise our kids whoever we want, who cares what our parents, like, it's about making our own choices for our own lives, and that's a cardinal secular virtue. The unintended consequences of it is we're less connected to other human beings, and that may result in higher suicide rates. And that's not doesn't explain it all, but it explains most of it. Yes, sir, in the way. Two points. Uh, expanding on a much of one of the very early questions, the trends that you have been describing are ver the, the other side, mostly the religious right, is very aware of them. And they have responded mm -hmm. very actively by controlling two things. One is government, mm -hmm. the other one is education. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't celebrate too wildly mm -hmm. just yet because we have to fight them on both of those fronts. I think you're right. I think you're right. They have all the money. I think you're right. They have, sh they absolutely do. You can say shitload here. Okay, sorry. So, okay. So this is my comment though. 
I would argue that what you just described, the religious rights takeover of government and education, and maybe we're just, I'm just being nitpicky here, was, is not a reaction to us. It's just part of their success that came in the 80s. So they decided it's time to dominate. You're right. Not because secular people are on the rise, but because of their own agenda. And so they have infiltrated government to a remarkable extent. They've infiltrated uh, and taken over education to a remarkable extent. It, it, we must battle them, and we, and we must. And, you know, that's also tricky because we're not pack animals. We're, we're individualists as secularists, and we're not as um, uh, connected to each other. We're not as networked, but that's all changing now. I see tremendous growth in the secular movements. I see tremendous political growth, and I, and I, hope, it, 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 um, I hope it continues and grows because it's the, the, the stakes of the planet are on the line. Yeah. A follow-up on the issue of finding the right label for, to describe us. No one has mentioned free thinker. As yeah, a, I like is, free thinker. Which is my uh, choice of term. I love free thinker. Now I gotta say, and maybe some of it's hard to put on a banner though. But yeah, but I love it. I love it, and I think it's it's positive, and it it it, it reflects our worldview. It's it was much more common in the 1800s around the time of Ingersoll and whatnot. But I love it. <laughs> but but I will say this. I will say this, and maybe um, others that I'm familiar with would agree. In a lot of these kind of gatherings, whether I'm at the FFRF or whether I'm at the American Human Association or whether I'm just invited, I notice this issue of what to label and call ourselves keeps percolating up. Yeah. And it makes me think it's indicative of something. It's indicative of what is our identity going to look like? Or else we wouldn't be talking about it, right? But we keep wanting to talk about how do I identify? How do I identify? So it's a good conversation, and it's a wonderful conversation, but I think it's indicative of this, of this bubbling up of secular community and secular identity. So, and and what, we don't need one. We don't need one label. We can use them all. And, and by the way, let's, uh, I, I, I was told that Thai food was on the horizon. Yeah, let's and I don't want to jeopardize that too much, so let's take one more. Yeah, one more question. One more. Yes, Has sir. there ever been a study to determine how many people who were through their whole lives never been too religious, but on their deathbed all of a sudden no. they got religion? <laughs> Not that I know of. Not that I know of. It would be a great and depressing study to do. Uh, to, yeah, to, to hover around deathbeds and get a random sample. and, and uh, But... Um, it's a good, uh, uh, but, but what no one ever talks about is the opposite. And I love this in Black Hawk Down. I don't know if you saw Black Hawk Down, a fantastic film. One of the more harrowing moments is when this young, it's a true story, when this young man is sustained. It's, it's about the American incursion to Somalia. One of our helicopters crashed. I think we lost 18 or 22 men uh, uh, and perhaps some women too. And this one soldier is deathly injured, uh, is losing all the blood from a ve vessel in his thigh. They can't stop it. It's a long, drawn-out, slow, painful death. And just as he's dying, he says, he sees there's nothing. There's nothing. This is just it. So not only are, they, are there those deathbed conversions towards religion, I would bet you there's a shitload that where people are like, uh-oh, there's nothing, and this is it. And let's end it there. Let's yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, one more time for Phil Zuckerman. Excellent talk. <laughs>